What's up, JFW family? Welcome back to the Channel 23 podcast. The purpose of this podcast is to reach out and touch the fleet, to engage and inform everyone with all things JFW. Super Dave, welcome back. Good to, good to see you again. Well, thank you, Jim. Yes, had a wonderful holiday with my sister. Awesome. We'll welcome get to back, that in a minute. All right. And as you just heard, we have a very special guest. Oswaldo Sanchez. Welcome, Oswaldo. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Oswaldo. <clears throat> I had to arm wrestle Oswaldo yesterday to get him up here, but you could see who won. Yeah, so. you're definitely stronger. <laughs> <laughs> More persuasive. You said no, I don't know, probably in the last six months, you said no about 50 times, but here we go. That's what he said when I asked him to train. He meant that, though. Every time, <laughs> no. I was getting no, ready to help you out, Sue, but... I became a dispatcher, so it was a little <laughs> bit too late. <laughs> well, Oz, you probably know we always kick off the podcast with the Pledge of Allegiance. So Let's here we go. It. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America, America and, and to, to the Republic for which it stands, stands one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, nothing better than coffee and a Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, as a reminder, anything you hear on the podcast today is not the opinion of JFW. It's the opinion of Super Dave, myself, and Oswaldo. Episode 60 was a little light. We had 261 downloads. I chalked that up maybe because of the holidays. We're almost at 22,500 total downloads, and our followers are holding steady at 155. So I want to see that. I want to see that number at 200 in the next six months. Dustin Romero commented on the last podcast. He said, Merry Christmas to all my JFW family. I love you all. So thanks, Dustin. We love you too. So I should probably wait till next week for Brother Dave and Brother Jim to be back. But I have a business idea. I want to start my own gun company. It'll be a rifle manufacturing company. And the reason I wanted to wait for Jim and Dave is because they're also dads, and you're a dad, Super Dave. I want you to be a partner on this. <laughs> It'll be by dads for dads, and I think I'm going to call the name of the first rifle a JK47. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. You get it? No? <laughs> JK47. That's, That's good. it. All right, Os, what do you got? Um... So, since Christmas just passed, why was E the only letter in the alphabet to get a Christmas present? Oh, man. That's a tough one. Because the rest of the letters were not E. Naughty. <laughs> Naughty. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually uh, really good. That is a good one, man. yeah. Most yeah. people that come on for the first time, they tell one that's already been told. So, you're already out of the game. That's, All right, Soup, what do you got? good. So, um, what is the fastest liquid on Earth? Huh. Fastest liquid on Earth? I don't know. Oswaldo? Water? <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. Milk is the fastest liquid on Earth because it's past your eyes before you even see it. Mm. <laughs> all right <laughs> there you go i got another one too this one was tell, cute tell the dog ones that you were telling us no stars. no this is, well i could tell that one too but i thought this one was cute so what do you call a snowman with a suntan <sighs> i think i know this one but i forgot i don't know a puddle ah, <laughs> there it goes. yeah yeah that's that's one that your six-year-old could tell huh <clears throat> well, soup. No, empl- no new employees this week, but uh, we got some new people starting the first week of January. We do. I know you've been gone for a few days. You're feeling the pressure to get some interviews set up and everything. Ah, uh, man, I tell you, I have a lot of applications. People were filling out applications on Christmas Day, wow. and I thought, wow. <clears throat> Nothing better to do than on Christmas Day than fill out a job application. <laughs> you I probably guess. have a lot of voice messages too, right? <laughs> no, I yeah. only had one. Oh, okay. I only had one. Okay. Celebrations. We have a big anniversary coming up. Tina Springsteen is here three years on Friday the 30th. Oh, wow. Congratulations, Tina. Yeah, yep. congrats. No employee birthdays this week, but we do have some family birthday celebrations. Well, only one to speak of. And that's uh, Casey Guthrie's daughter, Kylie. She's turning 13 this Friday as well. Wow. Happy birthday, Kylie. And speaking of celebrations, because 
Tina's anniversary and Kylie's birthday is on the 30th. The other thing that's happening on the 30th is we're having our Christmas party this Friday. We are closing down at noon on Friday. I don't think we've done that in the last four years. Uh, but <clears throat> noon, we're going to have a lunch. Even if you're off, please stop by and come say hi, hang out, grab some lunch. I'm sure we'll be making some kind of announcement of what to expect for the new year. So I'm excited. Yeah. Hey, I want to throw out another birthday celebration. Great. Um, my granddaughter, Lexi Leonard, is turning 14 wow. on New Year's Day. Happy so, birthday, Lexi. Yeah, we won't Happy have another birthday. podcast before New Year's Day. So That's awesome. Throw that out there. What does she want for her birthday? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, she already got it, actually. I think uh, my daughter and Jen and her husband got her um, a really big present for Christmas, and it was going to go for both Nice Christmas and New Year's. It was a, uh, a big old, what do you call them, long boards or the paddle oh, board? Yeah. Boards, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Paddle board. That's awesome. Yep. Well, I'm excited for the Christmas party. Last time uh, they had a big announcement, it was a big one. So. Uh, I don't know if it'll be that big, but it'll still be big. <laughs> you know, because we're always trying to improve and make things better here at JFW. So, you know, here we are another year. It's always exciting to see what's next. So, But I'm glad you're excited as well. There always is something next. There's yes. always something coming along and it's going to make us better. And Yep. And, more attractive, beefier, better benefits, stuff like that. More enjo- so. enjoyable to work here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, shout outs. CMEX. Russ from CMEX called and wanted to give a shout out to all the CMEX drivers. Quote, unquote, your drivers are super professional and make it so easy to work with. I appreciate you guys and how easy it is to communicate with JFW and how organized you all are. Just a pleasure, and it makes life a lot easier over here. Thank you. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Well, that was nice. When I first read that, I thought, our Russ, I, I <laughs> 82 thought, Russ. I thought the same thing. I'm I was like, like oh, good for you, Russ. Been there. <laughs> no, that's, uh, Russ is one of JR's contacts. But when you hear things like that, because we all know CMEX is pretty stringent and strict and very safety orientated. You know, so when you hear that we're doing a great job over there, it makes us feel like we're doing we're doing a great job, you know, and that's why they called us. You know, they wanted us there. They knew about us. They picked us, and we're, we're following through. We're coming through on our promise to do a good job, so. Yeah. I, the other day, I started listening to what I thought was the last podcast, and it turned out to be, like, a podcast that was really old, mm-hmm. and it was one where they were talking about CMEX, and Brother Dave was saying how CMEX only wanted belly dumps and not mm-hmm. end dumps, mm-hmm. and how they wanted either bellies or side dumps, mm-hmm. and now it's like we're doing such a good job, a belly dump just dropped the material on the scale, so I mean, it C-Max, sucks. Yeah. yeah, at CMEX, so it <laughs> sucks for that driver and for that company, but it sure makes us look pretty good that we're doing the right thing and we're doing it pretty good absolutely good point as well you see you're already you're already adding value to this podcast (laughs) i love it i I can't tell you how warm and and fuzzy i guess it makes me feel whenever we get a compliment from a customer because it means that we're out there doing the right thing and we're caring about what we do yep and so obviously that reflects one driver doing something great reflects on all the drivers but it's all about caring and all about trying to do your very best and that's what we talk about when we you know bring up the creed you know and uh, delivering that honest value every day yep we're just not pretty red we're not just pretty red trucks we actually do a good job too absolutely uh as you guys know we had a, a pretty good storm this past week last week Plus frigid temperatures, sub-zero temps. So it uh, it was a lot. But I want to give a shout-out, and also Potter wanted to give a shout-out to all the snow crew. And I want to name everybody that did that was actually part of the snow crew. And if I miss you, I apologize. But here's a list of names that I think I have. Rick Ray, Sergio Portillo, Mike Bortz, Jack Oquendo Mejia, Casey Guthrie, Dale Boyce, Jimmy V, Troy Hunt, Ray Ray, Fred Powell, Leroy Powell, Alan Martinez, Johnny Beret, Rosario Garcia, Paco Nahara, Ron Bugler, Gerardo Sanchez, 
Andrew Martinez, Jesus Varela, Vic Ochoa, Emilio Camacho, Edwin Ramirez, Tina Springsteen, and Greg Wise. Thank you all for doing a great job. Because it was, it was cold, it was not comfortable, and we got it knocked out. Yeah, thank you all. I know um, last year I was in the snow crew. I used to run a plow, and you just have to plow with your window down. I tried plowing <laughs> with my window up, and it was, it was impossible. So I don't know how the guys did it this time since it was so cold. But regardless, big shout out to them and all their hard work. Nice. Why do you have to have a window open? Um, you know, if, if you don't have an open, like can't really hear the blade, you don't uh, know if it's all the way down or not. Uh, I would also like stick out my window, uh, you know, make sure I'm not close to any other stuff. Huh. Um, if I had it closed, the windows would get too foggy and not I could it. turn on the heater, but then it would get too hot. <laughs> and then, uh, sometimes, uh, the snow would splash and get your window all dirty. And, and then mm. it was hard to see. So it was just way easier to do it with the window down. Got it. Got it. You know, I've never ran a snow plow. Not one time in my I whole never life. have either, Jim. Really? Yeah. Huh. I've always been in the yellow iron when we've been doing that all these years. Gotcha. Did you enjoy that, Oswaldo? Was uh, it a- yeah, it was pretty cool. It was something different. And obviously, it kept me busy during the winter. So sure. it was enjoyable. Were you over at Rolla or Intermodal? Or? Uh, we would start at Intermodal and then head over to Rolla at okay. the end of the day there. Awesome. Didn't know that about you. Very good. I want to give another shout out to Potter for organizing the whole thing and being a snow crew manager. I've never worked uh, as closely with Potter as I have last week and does a great job. I was pretty impressed. So thank you, Potter. Also want to give a shout out to the safety team, JR, Scooby, Pat, and Ken. They were they played an intricate role in snow removal this past storm. So thank you, guys. And then uh, I want to give a shout out to the Coors drivers during the snowstorm. And that was Charlie and Jason at nights. We had Eric Burnham, Gabe Chavez, David Gayton, and Ron Bugler. Those were the guys running cores during the storm. So great job, guys. Uh, another. Oh, oh, I was just going to say that that cold air, that cold weather, I mean, it was uh, 15 below zero, I think, pretty much all across town. And yep. that just is tough. I don't care if you're out doing snow removal, <clears throat> you're loading cores, you know, the all the airlines, all the, the things that freeze on the trucks. Yeah, it's it's a headache, and for those guys to deal with all that and be out there all night long, and then throughout the day, I mean, it was 15 below the next day too. Yep. So, yeah, we're gonna talk about the tailgates latching properly here in a minute, but we did have a tailgate pop open at Coors. Uh, Jason was driving, so he helped clean that mess up, and then <clears throat> we got the truck over here into the wash bay and sat overnight. And they had a uh, chain and a boomer on it, and that actually pushed out. So we had to take the chain off and drop a bunch of grain in the wash bay. And then Jason was here, stayed, helped clean that up. And uh, Eric Burnham, we were over there sweeping up, uh, shoveling that back up in the trailer. So appreciate that, guys. I just want to say a shout out once again to the course drivers. Yeah, I know it's hard working when it's cold, uh, especially with that grain and um shout out to linda because she actually came up with the idea of only using uh, three uh, trucks during the weekend Uh that way they didn't have to sweep out or you know try to shovel out the material and i thought that was great because once that material freezes it's it's really hard to try and get it out from there so i thought that was pretty pretty cool from linda and i'm sure that helped out the guys a lot absolutely yep three trucks was all that got dirty yeah once that freezes you'll never get it all out I mean, it's going to be stuck to the sides and to the floor. Yeah. You'd scrape all day long. It's not coming out mm-hmm. till it thaws. Chris Beam wanted to give a shout-out to Dale Boyce for dealing with cold start issues and the wind, which is pretty much a daily basis over at Arcosa, getting ready for those CMEX loads. So shout-out to Dale from Chris Beam. And then uh, I want to give a shout-out for Tanny. Uh, as you guys know, my stepdad had a heart surgery he actually had a pulmonary valve replaced, and it's so wild. They go up through your groin area, and, yeah, it's the least invasive way to do it. And the surgery was a great success, but and don't get me wrong. I mean, the people in the office all checked on my dad, you know, because we're in the same – not because we're in the same room, but it's easy to say, hey, how things are going, or I talked about it, but Tanny actually went out of his way and sent me a text message asking. So appreciate that, Tanny. 
And then uh, my last shout out is for Sammy Luna. We uh, went back and forth this morning. Sammy Luna used to work here. He actually still listens to the podcast and says that we're killing it. Keep up the good work. So thank you, Sammy. How's it going, Sammy? Shout out to Sammy. Actually, uh, my nickname for him was Ramiro. And what is that? It's just another name, you know. Okay. Just, we thought it would fit him a little better. <laughs> is that like is that like Romeo? Uh, I don't know. I don't oh, think so. <laughs> I can see that. Sammy the Romeo. <laughs> That's funny. Any other shout outs, guys? Um, I have a shout out for you, Jim. I know you don't like shout outs, but, you know, I always see you uh, working so hard on the podcast, you know, doing the outline for it. And I, I'm sure it's challenging to come up with something every week. I know sometimes you ask me for ideas, and most of the time I don't have any. <laughs> so Same here, Oswaldo. <laughs> so a big shout-out to you for, you know, coming up with the discussions and what some of the topics, most of the topics on this. So good job. I appreciate Oswald, that, Oswaldo. You were my idea for this week, so <laughs> thank you for being my idea. And then definitely not just me, uh, Brother Dave, Jim, and, and Super Dave, and you see me asking everybody, because sometimes it is hard. I'm like, all right, well, I need help. Somebody give me something, you know? And it does take a village for everything. And you may hear things that are going on that I don't know about. And Super Dave may have experienced something that I didn't know about. So I appreciate that. But thank you guys, too. All right. So last week, we had record low temps. Um, this time of the year, things are a little hard, you know, between the snow and the cold and plants ordering light or not being as busy because... You know, Brandon, they're not pouring concrete in sub-zero temps, you know. Plus, we got the snow, and then between New Year's or Christmas and New Year's, it's slower in general. So I just want to ask you all to hang in there. You know, New Year's is this coming up weekend, and we don't have another holiday for a while after that. So things will start to slowly ramp up. Obviously, the weather will still play a factor in that. But also, if you have PTO, you know, and things are a little tight, use a PTO day. You know, if you're new here, you may not be able to use all your PTO, but we'll try to help you out and get you a paid day if we can. Yeah, we had the shortest day of the year a couple of days ago. And, uh, you know, we just had the coldest cold snap we've had, I think they said in 30 years, something like that. Really? Yeah. And so, I mean, we're working through this. This is the deepest, darkest time of the winter. And once we get through New Year's here this coming weekend, everything is going to start to getting to get back to normal. Obviously, work is going to be a little bit slower because it's still January. But I've noticed this from all the years is that the contractors and the, the companies that are out there pouring the foundations and building the roads and building the, the new projects, they are looking and planning for the whole next year. Right. So things really do start looking up. We, you know, we learn of all the orders on the books. We, um, we learn of the, the things that are going to go ahead and start being poured and start going on, um, you know, maybe even a few more loads out of fair play. And uh, so it's something that we need to gear up for, too. We don't just sit around and wait for the, you know, spring to spring. You know, once spring is here, we got to be ready. We got to be rolling. Yep. And... Uh, we we're gonna get her done absolutely i really feel like we've been busy this winter i mean it seems like if the weather's cooperating we got work you know between c-max and the fair play loads and everything going on and all the salt i mean we're, we're definitely busy we got plenty of work we just have to have the days to do it so i feel like we've been doing more salt this year than normal too more than last year yeah i don't know about more than normal i think we did a little less last year but we're back at it full full force this year mm -hmm. so. yeah and then uh, having c-mix i feel like it also has helped us keep more trucks busy sure and uh i even noticed like with the leasers i think last year we stopped using them i don't know maybe around october and this year it was a few times in november where we were still using them just because we were so busy so i really feel like this year has been a little bit better i feel like we used some leasers last week we did yeah Yep. all right <clears throat> next on the list here back in and under the can so scooby went out and painted some new lines underneath the can to make it easier for people to see when they're backing in well apparently we just backed over the lines and we took all the paint off so oh, no. he's got to go back out there and 
paint some new lines. So if you go there and you see some freshly painted yellow lines to help you get square into the cans, try not to drive on the lines. I know, uh, you know, it's a little bit harder, but take the extra time so those lines stay there. And I'll help everybody else get squared up. <clears throat> Is there a special paint we could use that's tougher, like parking lot paint that, you know, I'm pretty stays. sure they use that. Like you're talking about what Marshall used to paint the lines here in the yard with? Well, I did. I know because I've gone out there and painted that before. And it is some like it is line paint, you right. know. But I just wondered if there was something more like plastic paint or so. You know what I mean? That they might use on the highways. I'm not sure. Huh. I Be worth the research. Yeah, if we can make it better, why not? So. As well, do I lie to you? I told you, you know, just come on the podcast. I won't interview you. We just need somebody else to have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and then once you agree to it, I got a list of questions I wanted to talk to you about. So, but it sounds like you've done everything. <laughs> Man, right? that's sneaky, Jim. <laughs> it is sneaky. <laughs> it is sneaky, but I was like, oh, got him. <laughs> Bait and hook. But uh, just talking to you earlier, you know, I didn't know you were in a snowplow. You were a cars driver. You have pretty much done it all, except for training. Right, not because you couldn't, because you didn't want to. But you started on eight twenty eighteen, which holds a very special place in my heart, because I started on eight twenty eighteen. Oh, yeah. Oswaldo and I share our anniversary date. We actually went on a date last year. We went to sushi. I fell short this year, so we'll have to double up next year. Uh, but the thing about Oswaldo that makes him better than me is Oswaldo's had perfect attendance in almost four years. And wait, four, no, over four years. Over. We're coming up on five years. Uh, next August. Yeah, yeah, August will be five years. Wow. I have not had perfect attendance. So kudos to you as well, though. Thank you. Thank Way you. to show me up. Uh, you've been a go-to driver, uh, and you've been in dispatch. It'll be four months on January 12th. So what, uh, what did it mean to you joining the dispatch team with Linda and Randy? Um, you know, I was really excited uh, just to be given the opportunity to try it out. And obviously, after I tried it out for a few weeks, they didn't let me go anymore. <laughs> but I felt really excited. I know you and me had talked previously and, you know, I had uh, been looking to do, try something new. Mm -hmm. And uh, this opportunity came up and, um, you know, I, I've i liked it and enjoyed it. It's actually kind of funny. I. Uh, before uh, you guys put it out that you were looking for a dispatcher, I actually had the idea of talking to Linda and just throwing my name in the hat and telling her like, hey, like if you ever look for someone, please, uh, you know, take me in consideration. And I, I had been thinking about that and going over that. And I was like, should I do it? Should I not? And next thing you know, you guys hired Garrett. And I was uh -huh. like, I lost uh -huh. my chance. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember uh, talking to JR and telling him about it. And then, uh, like, the week after that, you guys put it out that you guys were going to look for somebody else. And then JR saw me outside, and he asked me, like, so are, are you gonna, going to do it? And I'm like, man, like, I don't want to sound like I was just all talk and now back down. So, I don't know. It's, it's, it's been a fun journey for sure. That's awesome. It really came out of left field because, you know, we made the announcement, and then – JR told me that you were interested and right away like my, my eyes got big I was like really because you know everyone thinks that Oswaldo is this quiet guy you know but he's actually really a good communicator he's great on the radio so when I heard that I was pretty excited and I remember talking to Troy Hunt because he was asking about you know he had somebody he, he thought would be a good dispatcher and we had you know quite a few applications and he asked me he's like do you got a horse in the race and I was like, well, if you put it like that, I'd have to say Oswaldo. You know, I'd like to, to see Oswaldo win that race. And he did. I mean, without any influence from me, he just came in. You know, we had a uh, little test before. Because part of dispatching, you got to be able to run a computer and, you know, do some basic. You have to have basic computer skills. Like, you got to be able to work a spreadsheet, make a Word document, be able to work emails. So we had this little test, and Oswaldo came in and, he actually really did a good job on his Word document. He actually wrote a little essay, which was impressive. And his Excel spreadsheet was pretty nice. I was like, oh, okay, he's got some skills. And, you know, he got to try out and just, just crushed it right away. So 
That's pretty cool. I remember uh, you asking me, I think it was the day that I left early, if I wanted to take the test that day, and I said no. I was like, I'll just take it tomorrow. And that's just because I went home and uh, my wife actually helped me out. Uh, you know, I've used the computer before, but sure. it's been such a long time that I just needed a refresher. So, you know, she went over, you know, we did a little shard together and i'm like oh, okay like it all started coming back so ah. i really needed that refresher from her to you know be able to come in the next day and actually do that test oh that's pretty cool i didn't know that because you seem like you're a typist like maybe you learned that in school but you, you type well and we would have never known that so i didn't know it and i asked you about it i said yeah you know you up for that computer stuff and you're like <laughs> yeah I used to do that when you were you worked in insurance or something. Yeah, right. I worked for yeah. farmers insurance. Yeah, I was like, oh, okay. But uh, I think it's funny too, Jam. You've said it a couple of times. You're like, who is this guy? Right. <laughs> is this our Oswaldo? Yeah. I mean, yeah. he changed his name when he got down there. Everything. He surprised us. Yeah, <laughs> hidden talents. You are a man of many talents. <laughs> what did you do for farmers? Were you going to be a claims rep, or um, I just worked at the office, and I was actually uh, testing to be just get my license, you know, to sell uh, just uh, car insurance, home oh, insurance, to sell it. Got yeah. it. Yeah, understood. Man, that um, I know Linda used to be a claims rep, or. There's a claims adjuster. That job's intriguing to me. Not that I would, I mean, I love my job, but just working with the insurance companies and working with Samantha at Acuity, you know, some of that stuff's pretty intense. You know, it's I, very intense. Yeah, I like it. It's like you go to war, you know, with the opposing insurance companies. Absolutely, yep. And they'll roll their sleeves up, you know, mm -hmm. and go to war for you. So that's cool. So did you ever take the test or? No, so actually, um, I don't know, I just, I've, looking back, I just feel like I didn't give myself enough time to actually like learn it and mm -hmm. go in there. I feel like maybe I quit too soon. Uh -huh. um, at the moment, I, uh, the office that I worked at, I felt like um, there was some, a lot of training. I felt like the first, you know, the first training, I learned it really quick, and I felt like they thought I knew everything, <laughs> right. and they didn't really like teach me uh, new stuff. And I, I felt like I didn't know enough. Got and uh, at the at the time, um, I my sister used to work in the same office, and she was going to leave, and it was just going to be me and this other girl who didn't really know much. Uh -huh. So I, I just felt the pressure of being in that office and not knowing enough. And, you know, insurance, you have to make sure you explain everything the right way to people because mm -hmm. you could get in trouble if you don't. Uh -huh. And I didn't want to be in the spot where maybe I didn't explain it uh, the right way to people, and then they didn't really understand the insurance that they had and possibly later on getting in trouble for that wow yeah that is heavy i guess that's why you need a license huh uh, yeah i guess so uh, is that when you got into trucking after that or um i worked well with my brother-in-law uh driving a box truck um, delivering medical supplies for a little bit and uh at the time i started wanting to get my cdl so a little bit after that i went to school and got my cdl gotcha <clears throat> and then where did you drive before JFW? Um, I worked with uh, this guy that had like two trucks. Well, it was like one and a half. But <laughs> I worked <laughs> with him for a couple weeks. Uh, we would pick up fluff at All Recycling, and we would take it to Dad's Landfield. Or not Dad's, the one off of 88th and Tower, uh -huh. and uh, one up in uh, Erie. And I did that for a couple weeks, but it was... It was pretty bad working for that guy. And after ah. that, um, I applied here and actually Super Dave called me that same day and we set up an interview and he gave me the opportunity to work here, even though uh, I didn't have much experience. So that was pretty, pretty cool. Very cool. We must have been desperate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I, you must have shined in your interview. You must have hit all the right points. And That's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> i also yeah. put uh manny down as uh like as a reference and that's because one of my cousins actually worked here for a little bit and manny trained him so my cousin was like you should put manny down and i didn't even know manny you know uh -huh. and uh after the three months you guys gave him the bonus and i think he was like what's this for you know <laughs> that's yeah. funny yeah Who you referred somebody that does a great job. Here. Yeah, so I think that helped yeah. out a lot. Yeah. Who's that? Ish. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah, he is a friend of your wife's 
friend. Uh, he's right? actually a friend of my wife. They went to school mm. together. So and he's yeah. also Omar's brother-in-law. Omar's I know. Yeah. I didn't know that until just recently. Yeah. Shout out to Ish. He has his own song. I don't know if you guys know that. I'll play it for you downstairs. <laughs> yeah, it's called I'm the Ish. <laughs> yeah. It must be a rap song. And then who was your cousin that worked here? Um, his name is Braulio. He only worked here for, I don't even think he lasted the three months. He uh -huh. He didn't really have good work ethic. Does that no, ring a bell? You know? uh, oh, yeah. yeah, <laughs> oh, he, yeah. Didn't, he didn't last very long. Uh, <laughs> so what was your first few weeks in Dispatch like? Um, you know, I was I was a little rusty. I know Linda, you know, she would teach me stuff and then kind of sat, you know, behind me watching me do everything. And, uh, you know, whenever someone watches you, it's even hard to type. Mm -hmm. So I was a little rusty, and then I would doubt myself a lot when I was moving the trucks. Uh, every time I would move a truck, I would kind of need uh, either Dell's or Randy's approval. Uh. And uh, sure enough, Randy, one day he said, you know, you're doing a good job. Like, you just have to be a little bit more confident on yourself. Like, you're moving the trucks uh, really well, so... And that means a lot coming from Randy because he's known for moving the trucks really well. You know, for him to give you that compliment, that's pretty cool because he is an expert at it. So is Linda. So I guess that's my point. G getting in a dispatch, working with Linda, who's been in the industry for a long time. And Randy, I mean, he just hit a home run himself when he came to dispatch. That's got to be a lot of pressure to, to raise to that level, rise to that level. Uh, yeah, and then, uh, well, to me, it's more uh, exciting because I get to learn from Linda and Randy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's great being able to learn from Linda that's been doing it for so long. And obviously from Randy, you know, who goes out there and looks up for new jobs for us, you know, uh, runs out of town. So yeah. that's actually pretty exciting for me. Yeah, I want to jump in here real quick. So a lot of people might not understand uh, dispatch works in mysterious ways sometimes but explain to everybody what you mean by moving the trucks uh you know you just uh drivers maybe don't see this but you know we have a whole screen of orders that we have to do you know and uh you just have to make sure you move these trucks the best way possible where maybe they're not going from one side of town to the other just for a load that you know it's closer to that other spot mm -hmm. so you just have to make sure you're moving them uh sending them to the right place where it's going to be fuel efficient and uh make sure the plants get all their material and they're ready to go the next day so what you have to do is you you're not just covering loads you have to think about what's the most efficient route and the the best way to fill that and save the company money, make the company money, and that sort of thing. Yeah, and then also like all the Castle Rock loads, uh, especially now with the sand com coming out of distal, you know, you want to make sure that the guys that you send down there, hopefully they get a load back. Um, I know sometimes that's, well, the days that I was busy, it was a little bit hard because it would be like noon and we would still have, you know, loads from distal on the board, but all the plants needed material so that's when it gets a little bit more challenging uh to do that kind of stuff but at the end of the day you just kind of breathe and you're like man like i did it <laughs> so <laughs> it's uh, it's pretty good so it's pressure you have a lot of pressure huh it's a lot of pressure for sure yeah, yeah. he handles it well though and what's cool is you know between land randy linda and oswaldo they all have their like niche what they do during the day and it just really works well you know i I can't remember in the last, since I've been here, of dispatch running so smoothly. Mm. So No, me neither, Jim. It's, it's been nice. Was it how you imagined it would be, Oswaldo, or is it very different from, and I'm talking about from when you were in a truck saying, oh, I should throw my name in the hat, to uh, we hired Gary, to uh, we put the notice out. Is it like you imagined or different? Um, so coming in, I was... I didn't, I didn't really feel confident. I guess you could say I was pretty scared. Uh, one of my concerns was knowing everyone's name. Mm. And that's just because I, I didn't know people's driver's name. Uh, I have a really hard time memorizing names. And at the, the, when I was a driver, I wouldn't really talk to everyone. And that's just because you get here at a certain time, you get back at a certain time. You don't always see the same people. Right. Um, so that was one of my concerns. Uh, another was, you know, I was... I would always question myself if I would be able to move the trucks. And uh, coming in here, I found it, um, found myself learning a lot of names and actually 
communicating with a lot of new drivers, which I thought was really, really cool. And now he made it a point that every time I would talk to a driver on the company radio, I would actually see his name and call him by his name. That way it stuck to me. And with the program we, we use, we actually have to know uh, drivers' last names also. So yeah. I get to learn their last names as well. Seems like you may have given some of them nicknames too. Uh, yeah, it seems like it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe how many nicknames you've given everybody. I'm like, who's that? Oh, oh, okay. I can definitely understand your, um, you know, questioning yourself. Will I be able to move the truck? Will I be able to do this? Will I be able to do that? But you're you're kind of a natural. So from what I'm hearing, you didn't think you would be a natural. I, I really didn't. Um, I felt like I was so uh, comfortable driving that I was just scared to, you know, venture on into any new job or any new opportunities. So I feel that's part of my uh, uh, me questioning myself. I do. I am a strong believer in that everything happens for a reason. And uh, I feel like some of my past jobs have actually helped me. So okay. one of my first jobs, uh, I started working at Burger King when I was 16. Cool. I worked there from when I was 16 up to like when I was 19. And I started in the front uh, register. And I moved up to be a shift leader and then a store manager. Oh, so, wow. you know, I used to do all the inventory, schedule, and then I would have to deal with the call outs. So uh -huh. that, I think that's why, you know, my good attendance comes because I would have to find people to cover certain shifts. And when I couldn't find anyone, I would find myself having to work uh, an extra shift. You know, maybe it was a night shift or so on. So I feel like that helped me out a lot. How old were you when you were a store manager? I was like 19. Wow, that's yeah. great, man. So I feel at the, like at that age, I was a little bit more brave. Um, I was uncomfortable at that age. So I feel like that's why I was able to take that role. Sure. And does that job bring a lot of pressure as well? Because sometimes when I go through the drive-thru and they're shorthanded and I mean, you could tell it just seems very, very stressful in there and they're trying to get the orders out because most people think like, ah, oh, fast food, that's easy. You know, but I feel like when there's 10 cars backed up in a drive through and then there's a problem with an order, and is that pretty stressful? Uh, when I was uh, when I worked at a front desk, it, it wasn't because you just don't have so much responsibility. Right. Uh, one of the Burger Kings I worked at was, it's not there anymore, but it was off of Federal and 17th. So during Broncos games, it would get really hectic <laughs> oh, <man>. in there. <laughs> um, <Bad. laughs> so I learned how to like deal with that and uh, multitask. Sometimes I would be finishing up an order in the front and I would be taking uh, an order in the drive through at the same time. Uh -huh. um, when I became a store manager, it became a lot more stressful and that's why I left. You know, I just had to deal with the drama of the employees the and people problems the people problems yeah. it was it was challenging for sure uh. i think one thing people don't realize because i worked in a restaurant for several years myself and uh went through the same thing went from being a worker to a manager and had to deal with scheduling and everything but one of the most stressful things and people don't realize it is being a cook during a rush like a lunch rush or a dinner rush and you are moving fast uh. and you have to think ahead and you, you know, you're busy cooking and I'm just going to use Burger King for an example. You're busy cooking burgers and chickens and then you got to remember to get the fries out. You know, <laughs> right. the fries are beeping behind you, you know, I call and, that, uh, it's, it's intense. I call that like good stress. That's like the good stress of the job to challenge your mind. But what do you think the challenge, what do you think the secret is? To getting through a stressful situation. Um, so like at Burger King, obviously Burger King is not the same as McDonald's. McDonald's has a lot of mo more money coming in, so they have a person for every station. Whereas Bur Burger King, like you said, one person had to do a lot of stuff. So like during, during the rush hours, I would try to keep it fun with the employees. You know, mm -hmm. like I would try to motivate them like, you know, like, come on, come on, like, let's go, let's go. Like, let's try to get this truck under X amount of time. So I would try to make the environment uh, more fun when I used to work there. Um, I remember one time I made like this little contest to see who could uh, do a Whopper the fastest. And I think <laughs> I, it was like a $20 thing, you know, oh, to wow. see who made it faster. So I just, during those stressful moments, I just tried to make it fun for everyone. 
What about you, Soup? How do you get through stressful situations? What's your secret? You got to stay calm. That's what I'm looking <laughs> for. Yes. Yeah, we, we covered that a few weeks ago, I think, in a High Road Holland. But yep. yeah, yeah, I mean, you can't think if you're nervous. You can't yep. think if you're upset. You yep. have to stay calm. Yep. <clears throat> and having fun could be a way of staying calm. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? But that's the one thing I've learned through, you know, just in the Coast Guard going through drills or some of the fight training I've done. You got to be calm. If you be calm, you're a lot more likely to be successful in this situation. You know, if you look at fighting, if a fighter comes out and he's just all like raging, like just, ah, you know, he's probably going to guess out pretty quick where the guy that's being calm and weathers the storm, he'll be able to turn it up later on down down or further rounds. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. One of the best feelings you ever can remember, Oswaldo, is when you got through one of those big rushes. And it just kind of calmed down. And then you look back and you say, well, we just served 300 meals, you know. Yeah. And it's a great feeling. I, I love the restaurant business. It was a lot of fun. I, I feel like it's a, a good point to start, uh, especially when you're that young, because you get to appreciate things more. And just to give people a better customer service, especially like now when I go to fast food restaurants, I know how it feels. And I'm always nice to them, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it was Christmas Eve. We were just done. Me and my wife and my daughter, we, we were out doing something, and we were just done. And then my wife's like, well, what do you want to do for dinner? I'm like, you know what? Let's just go grab Wendy's, you know? And the line was big, and oh, it was wow. slow, you know? And I got to the window, and I, I like to tell people, thank you for being here, you know, especially on Christmas Eve. And, you know, you could tell when I told the one window to get paid and the one window that gave me my food, they really like to hear that instead of just like grab the food and run off yeah so it's good it's nice to be nice mm. right and yeah i'm i just it is so hard to work on the holidays yeah you know these people are out there grinding when everybody else is celebrating and my hat's off to those folks yep. absolutely you know? so us what's one of the more stressful things you've experienced in dispatch um there's times uh where like when it's busy and i know i haven't worked during the summer but we had some busy days this this year it's just hard whenever you know materials running low at plants Mm -hmm. uh, you need to move trucks because you want to finish like loads that are further away you want to finish them earlier in the day Um, that that's become pretty stressful to me and then uh, at a point one day I think only one day I was like, you know what, I need to go <laughs> walk her. <laughs> and then uh, Linda took over the radio, you know. Uh, but I just got stressed because the plants were low in material and I didn't know where to send the trucks. I'm like, well, if I move them, they're going to get even lower in, on material, you know. Sure. So that was uh, a pretty stressful day for me. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet, Oswaldo. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it? So in a situation like that, right, everything pretty much – needs to go perfectly so when plants are running low on material and you're trying to move trucks and then you have like a rogue dog that just went and did their own thing or didn't read their dispatch or brought material to the wrong plan or what does that do uh you know that just causes a a, a more stress or when they don't answer the company radio you know there's sometimes where you could only pull drivers from a certain plant and maybe that's just because they have more of that material. So you try to pull a driver, you're calling him on the radio, he doesn't answer. So then you have to wait another hour for a driver to get to the same plant and be able to pull him because the other plants really need that material or because they have a night pour, you can't really pull them. So that that causes just problems and, you know, it delays all the loads. Sure. Yep. <clears throat> what uh when you're coming into work what's going through your mind do you have to pump yourself up do you do push-ups before you leave the house <laughs> how, how do you get excited to come to work and what do you what, um, what's your goal for the day so when i leave my house i usually uh pray uh when i leave the house while i'm oh, driving man. i love that um usually i start praying when i leave the house and i'm done by the time i get on i-70 so it's not like i'm in traffic or anything and you know i just i just like it because i'm by myself and you know it's it's just nice after that sometimes i call some of the drivers that work here just because i used to call them every day before and it's just we're not talking to them anymore huh. so sometimes i'll call them in the morning 
And, uh, you know, part of my goal and uh, my prayers is to help me uh, be good to everyone, uh, give everybody a good attitude, um, especially with the drivers. I know that if it's late in the day and there's traffic and I'm still sending them up to fry to 12, you know, I want to make sure I do it in the most uh, respectful way. That way it doesn't affect the driver in a negative way and it makes them have a even longer afternoon if I'm rude to them. Ha. Huh. You ever heard the heard the term servant leadership? I haven't. Well, that's what you're doing. You're good leaders serve people. You know, you gotta lead to serve. If you're if you're leading to be a boss, because you aren't in a leadership position, you know, you're telling people where to go and what to do. But the fact that you want to give them a good attitude and Make sure you're doing the right thing. That's called servant leadership, and, and that's powerful. It really warms my heart to hear that you pray before work. Sometimes I do that, too. Sometimes I pray when I leave. <laughs> 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 or just be thankful that I got through the day. So that's amazing, Oswaldo. Do you have a point of frustration in dispatch? Um, I would say, you know, when they don't answer uh, the company radio, sometimes it gets uh, frustrating. And I get sometimes you turn it off maybe because you're on an important call or you go to a certain pit where there's a lot of noise like Fry, Morrison, and sometimes you just forget to turn it back on. But it's just frustrating when it's the same drivers that do it right. just because at that point you feel like they're neglecting you. They don't want to talk to you or, you know, they just don't want you to move them. And sometimes that could be pretty frustrating. They're not engaged. Yeah. Why is it important to have your radio on? Uh, you know, not only because sometimes we need to have you do something else or maybe the plant doesn't want the material out of Morton, now they want it out of Fort Lupton and you have to let them know. But also, you know, they might have their tarp open or they might have mm -hmm. their tailgate open and you have to tell them that. And when they don't answer, you have to look for their phone now mm -hmm. and call them and hope that they answer. So there's just a lot of things going on that it would be good if, you know, they knew right away. There's nothing faster than a company radio. When it comes to communication, that's the fastest, most direct way. One beep away. One beep, beep away. And that's why they're in all the trucks. And that's yep. why we all have handhelds. Yep. Absolutely. And I, I must say, <clears throat> it's easy to be guilty because I've been in that truck before. And you have two different radios. Maybe somebody else is, is on your step, you know, trying to talk to you through your window when you're on a job site. And you have to concentrate you know, especially when you're dumping. So you reach up and you turn that radio off. And then, this is going to sound terrible, but two hours later, you say to yourself, wow, that's been really quiet today. And you look up and it's <laughs> off. And I, I used to hate that. And, and when I when that would happen, I'd turn it right back on and I'd get on the radio and say, I'd say, Linda, I've just had my radio off for the last two hours. Did I miss anything? You've been looking for me? And and if that does happen to you, you know, take the high road and do that. Get on the radio and apologize and say, hey, you know, I was in a really stressful situation a minute ago and I had to shut my radio off and, um, you know. Were you trying to get a hold of me? <laughs> <laughs> no, you just sit there and say, wow, it's been really quiet. And then you look at the radio and it's off. Yeah. So it happens to everybody. Oz, is there something that you'd like to change in dispatch? Um, I think it would be... I don't know if it's something possible or not, but and not not really dispatch, but for the drivers, I think it would be really cool if, you know, in our busy season where, you know, maybe some plants have night pours and, you know, we make like Brandon or Fry stay open late. It would be it would be nice if we could uh, reward the drivers for getting that last load. I feel like, you know, uh, a lot of drivers do go and get it. Um, a lot of drivers maybe drag their feet so that they won't have to go. And I understand both sides. I mean, they are getting rewarded by getting an extra load. They get extra money in their pocket. But at that time of day, there's just so much traffic that it's not your typical, you know, midday load where it's going to take an hour. It's probably going to take an hour and a half just to go get loaded and then go get dumped and then go back to the yard and fuel up and you end up leaving pretty late. So it would be nice if there was a way to reward the drivers. So you're talking about a spiff, like, okay, if you go get this late load, it's extra 20 bucks. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think we've talked about that. I think one of the things that comes up is what about that early load that only takes 45 minutes instead of 
an hour and 15 minutes. Right. You know, I'm not shooting your idea down. This is just, if I recall correctly, because we've talked about this, and I do think it's a good idea, and maybe that's something we could take another look at. But, yeah, this load may take 90 minutes, but your first load when there was no traffic took 45 minutes, and then the loads during the day took an hour and 10 minutes. You know what I mean? So, And I'm just making those numbers up, obviously. But Yeah, I do that, explain that to people. That is how you um, make more money here. It's how you excel helping to get the customers their loads, the loads that they need is first the early load, <clears throat> which requires that alarm to go off super, super early, and then to have the discipline to fight your way through traffic and get that last load as well. Right. And I did have a driver tell me, this was years ago, um, you know, because we were just, you know, talking off the cuff. And I said, yeah, I, I love doing those preloads because you're already preloaded. You jump in your truck and you drive down to Castle Rock in, in 30 minutes instead of an hour. And he, he looked right at me and he said, I will never, if I can help it, never have a preload on. When I come into the yard, I want to be empty. That way I can always be at Fry at 5 o'clock. Mm. I was like, hmm, boy, you know, that does make sense. But it takes a lot of discipline to fight your way down to, you know, plant 13 or out to Aurora to plant 12 during rush hour because it's, it's a struggle. It's less efficient. I guess the key would be to have a preload every night. Because then you're always going to get, it's not like you're missing that early fry load. You'll always have a preload. You go deliver while everybody's going to the pit. If you did that every day, I think in the long run, that would work out better. Hmm. I don't know, because you're ne- then you're not going to get your first load of the day on. How, how do you consider it? Is it your last load of the previous day or the first load of your new day? Right. I mean, you what, know? yeah, you got to kind of figure that out in your head. Yeah. But, would you rather go deliver? Would you rather have one on the ground at five thirty, or be loading at five o'clock? I guess both. Both. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess the name of the game is just be efficient, keep your head down, keep the door closed, keep the wheels turning, and you're gonna make mm-hmm. money. But we do like that idea. Maybe we'll bring it back up into the steering committee. But yep. Yeah, I just uh, you know I know a lot of drivers value the time at home, the value of their time with their family, and I I do too, and that's great. And sometimes getting out that late might affect that a little bit, just because you're getting home so late. It does. So, yeah, when you're early, everybody else is still sleeping. That's right. They don't miss you as much. <laughs> right. Good point. What kind of uh, longevity can we expect out of you in your current position, Oswaldo? And do you have your eye on another position here at JFW? Um, so currently, I, I don't really have my eye in any other position. Um, I would like to if stay here at JFW. I like it here. Um, working in the office has made me uh, like this job and the company a lot more. Uh, when, when you're in the truck, you kind of only look at, I know you guys say that, don't look at your own pie, a piece mm-hmm. of the pie, but it's hard not to just because you're by yourself. Uh, but in this position, in this role, I've really learned how to look at the whole pie. Mm-hmm. Um, I would like to learn everything there is to dispatching. Um, there's a lot of things I don't know how to do. And I know I was talking to Linda last week and she was telling me how we would start diving into more uh, dealing with the salt loads and then uh, dealing when like uh, people call in and they want us to move material for them. So how to deal with those calls. And I thought that was pretty cool. And, you know, I want to learn that. So for now, I would, I would really like to stay uh, on dispatching and learn it. But in the future, I would definitely like to, you know, maybe move to a different position and a position that I can contribute with JFW and keep, keep uh, making it better. Awesome. Would you be interested in being a podcast host? Mm, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I tried. I- I enjoy doing these podcasts so much, but man, I would freeze up hard if I had to be in your shoes because ah. you're 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 the you know the timekeeper. I guess you you know you're you'd be fine. <laughs> Nobody looks at their watch unless we have meetings and stuff to go to. But yeah, well, Oswaldo, I think that's all I have for your non-interview we did today. But please keep chiming in and speaking up. Did you have anything you wanted to ask Oswaldo, Sue? Yeah, I mean, it, you kind of already answered it, but do you ever feel the pressure from the drivers mm. being a driver 
and you know what it's like to send somebody up to fry at 4.30 in the afternoon and they do they ever give you a feedback or, or push back and say, really, Oswaldo, do you know what time it is? Uh, you know, they haven't said that. Um, sometimes by their tone, you could tell they're saying that. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so it is hard. Uh, I, one of the things I've been trying to do is uh, send everybody rock to 12 uh, until like 1 or 2 in the afternoon. And everything after that, send them to plan 2 just because it's closer. Mm -hmm. They don't have to get all the traffic from I-25 all the way to cha uh, Chambers. So that's something I've been trying to do just so that we don't have guys going to 12. I don't know if that will be possible during the summer just because, you know, there's been times where there's more than 10 trucks at plan 2 and I know that that's also not good or maybe plan 12 really needs the material. So I don't think that's something I'll be able to, able to do every day, but definitely it's something that I've been trying. And uh, I do feel the pressure, but I think I feel more the pressure of having the plant run out of material. Uh, so I think that's that's bigger, you know, than the emotions. You got it drivers. on both sides. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when you dispatch somebody late, <clears throat> Your phone doesn't ring. They just go do it. You don't. <laughs> have you ever said, all right, go do this, and then all of a sudden your phone's ringing? Like, can I take it to plan two instead? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, I've had that happen a few times. Have you lost any friends moving into dispatch? Um, you know, <laughs> um, I guess in a way I do feel like some people or, you know, I've heard some stuff that I changed. Mm. But I feel like anytime you change a position you change roles you have to change to fit into that position mm -hmm. um so i'm not really worried about it at the end of the day you know if there were true friends or you know if they were there for you they would they would be happy for you and they would right. support you in any way absolutely great point I well said because you it is true you know you do have to change yeah good stuff all right, we got quite a bit of safety topics this week. Uh, JR wanted me to bring up that uh, heavy permits, they are not valid during adverse weather conditions. So if there's snow on the ground or if it's snowing, you cannot haul that 92,000 pounds. You can't use your heavy permit. Why, why can't we use heavy permits in adverse weather suit? It's the law. <laughs> it's um, the rules of the permit itself. If you do, you disregard those rules, you very well could lose not only your permit via our own rules here at JFW, but DOT could slap JFW and take the entire company's permits away. Wow. And so that's a big deal. Um, they are essentially for the safety of yourself as well as the general motoring public because uh, to haul that heavy and you're, you know, dealing with wet roads or frozen roads, snowy roads, it makes it even more dangerous than just hauling the weight itself because hauling that extra weight is more dangerous. It takes more time to stop. The truck is under um, more stress from being heavy weight, you know. Um, tires, brakes, the whole nine yards. So it, it is important that we follow those rules. Absolutely. <clears throat> Next on the list... Bumping your tires after a long weekend. So we just had a long weekend, and we got another one coming up. Why is it important? Because we're always going to bump our tires, right, during our pre-trip. But why are we stressing this more after a long weekend? Well, <clears throat> because things seem to happen. Those, those long weekend gremlins come and hit us. It, <laughs> it's kind of funny. They're real. <laughs> Everything might seem fine when you parked it, even if you did a good post-trip. But uh, it's amazing the things that happen when the truck sets for a couple of days. Um, one thing I'd like to point out, too, is you got to listen for those tires. When you do bump them, you got to listen for the sound. And if, they, if something sounds, you know, like uh, it's low, try moving the truck a couple feet and hit it again. If it still sounds low, then you're going to want to stick it with a, a pressure gauge, a tire gauge. But there's other things you need to look out for. Obviously, look for your trailer inflation light to make sure that it's going to go on momentarily at the beginning. That's just happen. It's normal. It happens when you start your truck. But if that stays on for more than five minutes, then you've got a leak somewhere. It's trying to air something. Another thing that people kind of don't do is when you charge the tractor, 
push the tractor button in, let it completely charge until you stop hearing the air working through your system. You hear it in your dashboard. You hear the air compressor working. Then go ahead and press your trailer button in when you have 125 PSI in your tractor. Let it go through its charge sequence. In other words, you don't just push both buttons in and drive away. Right. It's not that fast. But when you do charge your, your truck set the tractor brake and then go walk around and, and listen to that trailer airing up. Listen for any air leaks in the tires or even in the airlines. When it's cold, the airlines can shrink and you might have a little bit of a leak on a, on a junction mm. or a, you know, a connector. And you just got to be more careful than on a 75 degree summer morning. Sure. What is, uh, so you said bump your tires. If it doesn't sound good, move up a little bit and bumping again. What does that do? Why would somebody do that? Well, a lot of times it's the ground it's sitting on. If if you're sitting, you know, I know our yard is concrete, but there's cracks in the concrete. There's mm. there's junctions. If that tire is sitting on a low spot mm. where the tire next to it is sitting on a high spot, they will sound different. Ah, gotcha. Gotcha. That makes when sense. When it comes to, to the tires also, I don't know. When I used to drive, I would see a lot of people airing up the tires every morning. <laughs> every morning. <laughs> uh, or sometimes, you know, like twice a week. And it's like, have you written it down? You know, yeah. like there's probably something going on. Yeah, maybe it doesn't have a nail anywhere. But it might have a, a different type of leak that the shop could definitely work on it. Sure. Valve stem right. could yeah. Yeah. They do such a good job. And maybe a lot of drivers don't know that, but that's something really good. And uh, check your tires. Like for me, checking the tires was like me at home every night, making sure the garage garage door is closed and my doors are locked. You know, it's something that I have to do every night. And with driving, that's something I had to do every night and every morning as well. So, yeah, I mean, uh, one of the other things, the reason you want to really check this stuff out before you leave, especially after a long weekend, is you don't want to get down the road and have a flat. It's a lot easier to take care of that flat before you leave, you know, depending on where you go and when you notice your flat. If we got to send a service truck out there that's taking your time up, that's taking time away from the shop where they could be doing something else, it's just very proactive to take care of these things before you leave. Absolutely. You know, Jim and Dave told me when I first started, and it stuck with me all this time, if you have a low tire, it didn't just magically lose air. There's a reason right. it has a leak, you know, and uh, so you need to take care of the root of the problem. You got to fix the leak. And to Oswaldo's point, okay, so you come in and you, you got a tire that's 10 pounds low and you're like, you know what, I'm going to put 10 pounds in today and keep an eye on it. Well, then it's 10 pounds low again the next day. You got a problem. You got a leak. You, know, you got right. a leak. Yeah, just yep. write it up. It's not like you got to fix a flat. Let the shop fix it. You know, you, you may even top it off again that day and write it up when you come in. I can understand. Yeah, that. And I, I would like to point out, too, you can't just keep airing tire up because that means you're running it low during the day mm -hmm. and it's going to wear poorly. And once you get a tire that's wearing badly, it won't stop. You could get the you could get the tire fixed so it's it's not losing air anymore. But that wear pattern will continue. Huh, I didn't it, know that. It doesn't just start going back to normal. It. it that cup in the tire or the bad um, tire groove that's worn down a little bit, it will continue to wear. Ah. Something you need to to fix right away. Don't run it like that. Agreed. Next on the safety topic list, we got uh, your tailgate latches. So something we experienced with this storm with our cores drivers is the ice buildup on the tailgates was setting, getting so big the dogs or the tailgate latches weren't latching completely or they were looking like they were latching completely, but they weren't actually cammed over. And when we say cammed over, if you go to the side of your trailer and you look underneath, you'll see the rod or bar that connects to your tailgate latch. And then there's a second bar <clears throat> and they're, they're on a pivot point. Well, those bars need to be almost centered or past center or pretty damn close to center. If not, if you got any kind of angle other than zero degrees, it could be like 10%. They're not cammed over all the way, and you don't have enough pressure on those tailgate latches to keep them closed. That's the reason we actually had a tailgate pop open this weekend is because those those arms or, or bars were not cammed over properly. So 
clean your tailgate, seals off, make sure there's not a lot of buildup in there. If you got a gap between your tailgate and the, and the trailer itself, you got to get to some doing some chipping. But easy way to tell if you're safe is look underneath and uh, see if those those arms are cammed over properly. Essentially, having them canned over is is it's a locking mechanism. Right. They cannot pop open if they're cammed over. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. If they're not, there's just nothing really holding that latch closed. So you're kind of getting lucky. The air pressure don't. of the truck. Right. And if you have 20 tons of grain or right. gravel or whatever you've got, it's enough pressure to push that open. Yep. If you got questions on this, uh, Mikey's actually the one that kind of brought me over to a trailer and, and showed me what it should like look like versus what we were getting pictures of from the drivers. If you got a question on this, just come see me. I got the pictures in my phone. Next on the list, we got clean windows and mirrors. I was shocked how dirty windows were on the trucks that drove out. So that was from Jim, you know, with, with the overspray, kind of like you were talking about with the plow truck, Oswaldo. If you got a lot of spray on your windows and mirrors, you just can't see as good, you know. I want to be able to see as much as possible. As you get older, your vision isn't as good, and you need to see more. So Another thing I would do, especially in this time of the year, I would clean uh, my headlights and all the marker lights yeah. on the trailer. Uh, you know, the marker lights would get so dirty that I'm sure during the day it's hard to see when you have your turn signal on. So yep. those were some things I used to clean as well. Yep. Chris actually gave that tips and tricks last week. You know, definitely wipe your taillights. Yep. And when, you're, when you're wiping your tailgate off after yep. you dump, clean your taillights as well. Yep. I'd like to point out, you can get a ticket for that. Mm. If your lights are not cleaned off in bad weather, they can write you up for that. Mm. Obstructed. They're obstructed. Ha. Didn't know that. Man, I'm learning a lot today. Do you have any other safety topics you guys want to hit? Oh, no. I mean, I could think about a few. I mean, all cold weather related. And we've got what? What do you think we have? Two whole months left of cold winter weather. Shh. We're just getting started. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, we actually have a storm rolling in. I know Kendrick's going to go spray. We're Tonight. expecting anyway between 1 and 60 inches of snow. So, <laughs> <laughs> And then another one on Sunday? New Year's Day. Yeah. Day, night. Yeah. So yep. Sunday night. Yeah. I don't, I don't mind the snow or the cold. I don't love either. But when they're together, when it's sub-zero temps and you got a snowstorm, yeah, that was rough. Tips and tricks this week. Leave enough room for fuel when you're getting loaded to go through the port. It's about 500 pounds of fuel. You need to leave room for an average. So basically what that's saying is you're going to get preloaded. You're going to pick some ice, uh, some some salt down to Colorado Springs or up north or wherever you got to go through a port, but you're loading while you've ran all day and your fuel tank is about 68 gallons low, Right. You need to leave room because you're going to have to fuel up. So keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I learned this when I was hauling fuel, and I think a lot of people don't know this, but depending on the temperature, the fuel can be denser and heavier or lighter. Um, on a hot 95-degree day, that is going to run about 7 pounds per gallon. But on a cold day, it's going to be over 8 pounds per gallon. So... Um, <laughs> You know, a good rule of thumb is to just figure out about eight pounds per gallon, but that 500 pounds is a fair average. Um, sometimes it might be three, sometimes it's six. So that's a good average to use to just leave that. Don't don't load 79.9. When you get back to the yard and fuel, you're going to be over. Right. <laughs> yeah. Any other tips and tricks from you, Oswaldo? No, I don't, I don't think I have any. No? All right, Soup, you want to hit us with that high road hauling? I can do that, absolutely. Awesome. So at the end of the year, this is the last high road hauling of the year for 2022. Do you believe that? It's the end of the year. 2022 went fast. And I always like to look back and I always like to reminisce or, or try to take into account what's happened, uh, what have you succeeded in, um, what have you failed in, right? But also appreciate 
what you've been blessed with. And uh, I think a lot of people look over that and they don't really realize, hey, I'm, I'm doing pretty good or I'm blessed with a beautiful family or a wonderful job. And all these things can get overlooked easily when you're under the stress of dealing with the day-to-day things um, that we're all met with, right, every day. So I put together a list of stories, I guess, uh, that might help focus on what we all need to appreciate every day. So the first story is, I recently met a super wealthy and influential businessman at a corporate conference. The man has a net worth of over $100 million. In conversation, he told me he regretted never making it to his son's hockey games or his daughter's dance recitals. It made me smile because my total net worth is probably only as much or less than the man's last paycheck. But I've made it to everything, and my two children always smile and wave to me in the stands during practice and on game days. The second story. Today is the 14th day in a row that my 87-year-old nursing home patient's granddaughter has come to visit. Two weeks ago, I told her that the only time I see her grandfather smile all week is when she visits him on Saturday afternoons. Um, Three, in the final decade of his life, my grandfather woke up every single day at 7 a.m., picked a fresh wildflower on his morning walk, and took it to my grandmother. One morning, I decided to go with him to see her. And as he placed the flower on her gravestone, He looked up at me and said, I just wish I had picked her a fresh flower every morning when she was alive. She would have really loved that. The next one, the biggest nerd in my 2004 high school graduation class, a nice, quiet boy who I wasn't very nice to, is now the heart surgeon who saved my mom's life after she suffered from a sudden heart attack at 68 years old last night. And the next one, I was recently reunited with an old friend after nine years of silence between us. Throughout high school and college, we were best friends. And then just before college graduation, we got into a nasty fight over a boy. Terrible, hateful words were exchanged, and we never spoke again until today. And as we hugged each other and cried, we acknowledged how irrelevant that boy is now. And today, my daughter firmly confronted me with the fact that my biggest fear a fear that has undoubtedly held me back from many life experiences have never come true. And I'm turning 76 year old tomorrow. In the next one, I sat down with my two daughters, ages six and eight, this afternoon to explain to them that we have to move out of our four bedroom house and into a two bedroom apartment for a year or two until I can find another job and build our savings back up. It's a conversation I've been avoiding for over a month as I've struggled with the doubts and regrets of not being able to provide a financially stable household for us. But my daughters looked at each other and looked up at me after I told them, and my youngest daughter turned to me and asked, are we all moving into that apartment together? Of course, I said. She said, oh, well, it's no big deal. An experience I had recently opened my eyes to how these stories illustrate what is really important. On an early morning hike through the mountains, I had to stop and take in the crystal blue sky, listen to the gentle breeze rustling through the trees, the birds singing, and the smell of fresh air. I had to turn to my wife and give her a kiss, because at that moment, there was nothing more beautiful in this whole world. So take a moment to really appreciate the gift that the gifts that we have in this life, and uh, that's it for the day. I like it. It's really good. Good stuff, Sue. All right, guys. Um, Brother Jim will kick up our final thoughts. He says, this year has been amazing. Such growth from all of you and how we are looking forward to 2023. Like every year, should be some amazing changes. So thanks for chiming in, Brother Jim. Oss, you have any final thoughts? Um, yeah, um, I, would, I would like to just tell the drivers to – Pick a drivers or anybody else to pick a group of people that motivate them to be better. Mm. Um, as a driver, I would find myself talking on the phone almost all day. And unfortunately, sometimes you would talk to people who were always negative. Mm. And, uh, you know, 
at points I would even talk to drivers that are no longer here that were not happy with their with the job here. Uh -huh. And sometimes their negativity, you know, rubs up on you and you start being negative and you you start hating your job but also just because they hate it. So I'll just advise everyone to, you know, stay away from negative people, surround yourself with positive people and, you know, help each other to to stay positive. I'm going to surround myself with Oswaldo. <laughs> so positive. That's so true, Oswaldo. You know, the positive energy is powerful, but that negative energy is as powerful in, in a negative way. We always say they're both contagious. Yep. What do you yeah. want to spread? Yep, right? absolutely. Soup, you got any final thoughts? Yeah, just um, again to those blessings that we're all, um, we all have, even though we might not realize um, <laughs> I had my sister who was scheduled to come out during the pandemic and uh, they pretty much put a niche on that. And so she's been sitting on these airline tickets for two years and uh, decided to make this trip this Christmas. And I'll tell you, it was a pain in the neck. Um, DIA was a madhouse. As everybody's probably heard, Southwest Airlines like literally crashed. Thank goodness she was flying United, but it still wasn't without um, struggle and long lines. And I spent more hours at DIA over the past week than I have in 10 years and, uh, all together. Right. But yet the visit with my sister was worth it. I haven't seen her in over six years and we're both getting up in years. We're both getting up in age. So we have to relish the time together that we, we have, and she was my big sister. So it was really a special Christmas for me this year. And I just want to thank Sue for coming and, uh, Appreciate it very much. Yeah, that's awesome. And I hope this doesn't sound negative, but I was watching a video <clears throat> and uh, the interview asked the guy, how many times do you see your mom a year? And the guy said, two. And the mom was probably, let's just say 80 years old. And the guy says, okay, well, let's just assume, and she was healthy, but let's assume she's going to live five more years. So you're going to see your mom 10 more times. And that really kind of punched this guy in the face. Like, you know what? I need to make more time to, to go see my mom. You know what I mean? Or my, my sister, she just lives in Evergreen. <laughs> and at this rate, you're going to see yours more than I'm going to see mine. So I definitely need to make the time and go, go see my sister up in Evergreen. Yep. You know? So glad you had a good trip with your sister, Sue. Good stuff. Yep. Uh, my final thoughts. This is the last podcast of the year, so I just want to... Thank everybody for listening. Whoever thought this little JFW podcast would actually have some followers. <laughs> so I think that's pretty cool. And uh, I want to thank all my coworkers, whether you're on the leadership team or Jim and Dave or, you know, dispatch or driving or the girls upstairs. Like, I just want to thank you all for making this amazing place to work. So let's hit the creed and get on out of here. Together, Together we, we face and overcome all that stands before us. Together we are accident free. Together we joyfully create honest value for those we serve. Together we celebrate our differences and respect those with whom we work. Together we are accountable for our words and our actions. And together we are the JFW family. Thanks everybody for listening. Have a happy new year. And don't forget this Friday the 30th at noon. We're having a party here, so That's hope right. to see everybody there. Have a great day, everybody. Yep.